I'm Kira Janine, and you're listening to DNA Today. How is it that we find ourselves surrounded by such complexity, such elegance? The genes of you and me, the genes of you and me, are all made of DNA. We're all made of the same chemical DNA. We're all made of DNA. DNA Today informs you on what's happening in the genetic world. You can listen to all episodes at dnapodcast.com. Today, I am talking about CRISPR. CRISPR is a genetic editing technology that has blown up in the past three years. It's been called the hottest technology since PCR. And if you know what PCR is, polymerase chain reaction, you know how big of a deal that was when it came out. So think about how big CRISPR really is if it's being compared to that. So today, I'm going to get into how CRISPR works, how it's discovered, also current research, future impacts of CRISPR, the ethics behind CRISPR and things that we question around it, the politics, and also the patents that's happening behind all of it. So what is CRISPR? Let's start for what it stands for because it is an acronym. So CRISPR stands for Cluster Regulated Interspaced Short Palindromic Repeats. So that's a mouthful, so we call it CRISPR. It's naturally occurring in the immune defense of bacteria and other microorganisms. Researchers are discovering methods to modify this defense system and use as a genetic editing technology. Using this adapted technology, science are able to inactivate genes and even incorporate new genes into genomes. It has the potential to correct point mutations in DNA, which point mutations cause diseases like cystic fibrosis, single cell anemia, Tay-Sachs, diseases like that that are very severe but only caused by a point mutation which means where there should maybe be an A there's a T in the nucleotide sequence in someone's DNA. Due to modifications in the CRISPR system not only can DNA be targeted but recently as of March 2016 RNA has been targeted. So by by targeting this RNA we have the potential to cure diseases that are caused by defective RNA transport such as cancer, autism, HIV. These are huge diseases we have never been able to find cures for, and CRISPR may be the system that can cure um, defective RNA transport diseases such as cancer, autism, and HIV. CRISPR-Cas9 immunity is usually performed through three stages. The first one is adaption, the second is CRISPR expression, and the third is interference. The first phase, the adaption phase, is where the viral DNA is acquired. So it's taking from, we're getting viral DNA and putting it into the bacteria. So we're inserting it into the bacteria's own genome. And the DNA that's being transferred here is called the spacer DNA. During uh, CRISPR expression, the spacer DNA is transcribed into CRISPR RNA. And the CRISPR RNA helps guide a certain enzyme to viral DNA to have it be cut up and not being able to be infected in the bacteria. That's why this is a bacteria immunity system. Now the last phase, the interference phase, occurs when the CRISPR RNA is paired with this Cas protein that I was talking about, and it guides the Cas protein to a specific DNA location to be cut by the Cas protein. So I said it's naturally occurring in bacteria. Bacteria have the CRISPR system and utilize it as an immune defense. Bacteria have palindromes. Palindromes are short repeating DNA segments around 20 base pairs long. And this is really short when we think about how big the human genome is. Palindromes are sequences of DNA that read the same forward as backward. So like the word kayak, if you read kayak forward, it's the same as if you read it backward. That's how palindromes are. And they're repeated throughout the genome in groups clusters that are evenly spaced, regularly interspaced, throughout the genome. So there we're breaking down what CRISPR stands for. CRISPR stands for clustered, regularly regularly interspaced, short palindromic repeats. So we have this clustering, this grouping of palindromic repeats that are evenly spaced in a certain area of the bacterial genome. That's breaking down what CRISPR actually stands for and means. So within these repeating sequences are unique pieces of DNA. This DNA is originated from viruses and referred to as the spacer DNA. 
And when a bacteria encounters a virus it has never seen before, it cuts up the virus genome and fragments from the virus genome are then inserted between these palindromes, between these groups of little repeating sequences. It's put in there. And the spacer DNA sequences are inserted to create a history of the viruses the bacteria has encountered, therefore developing that immune system. The same species of viruses can then be recognized as foreign to the bacteria and further cut to destroy the virus. CRISPR repeats and spacers from the bacteria's DNA are then transcribed into RNA. That's going back to DNA to RNA to proteins. So we have the CRISPR repeats and spacers. That sequence is transcribed into RNA. And that RNA is then cut into smaller fragments, and it's then called CRISPR RNA or guide RNA. Those are kind of used interchangeably. So this CRISPR RNA, the guide RNA, targets specifically to the invading virus because it has a matching sequence with it. So if it's matching, it can find its other half kind of thing. The specificity results from the CRISPR RNA having an identical sequence of the viral, viral genome sequence is produced based on the spacer DNA. So this RNA is made from the spacer DNA that originated from the virus. Therefore, that's why they are so closely matching and in most cases identical. The CRISPR RNA then aids in the process of destroying the genome of the virus by guiding this Cas enzyme to the specific location in the viral genome that's identical to the CRISPR RNA sequence. And so it's guiding it there so that it can cut it at a very specific point. Once the CRISPR RNA has brought the Cas enzyme to the specific location, that's when it cuts the virus's DNA up. And if a virus's DNA is cut up, it's not going to be able to be functional. And the enzyme cuts both strands of the virus's DNA at the sequence that matches the spacer DNA. Again, we're really focused on it matching. And that's how we are cutting at a very specific point in its DNA. And as I said, the virus relies heavily on the machine, the cell's machinery to replicate its genome so that it can in continue infecting other cells. So by destroying the veno genome, the cell really destroys the virus. So that is the way that a lot of bacteria get rid of viruses, by incorporating some of a virus's genome, the spacer DNA, into itself, and then when it sees that virus, produce that in order to find a certain place on the virus in the genome and cut it up so that it's no longer functional. So there's different CRISPR systems. The most popular is the Cas9 system discovered in the labs of Jennifer Duna and Emmanuel Carpenter. And the Cas system is found in bacteria Streptococcus pyogenius. A Cas protein is an enzyme and it's produced by the CRISPR locus. As I said before, the CRISPR locus is that segment that is getting transcribed to RNA that, origin that then eventually will guide the Cas9 enzyme or a Cas enzyme to that specific point of the virus DNA. And it cuts, again, at two places on both strands. So it's a double-stranded str break. And it leaves the DNA having a blunt end, meaning the DNA does not have any bases unpaired. Um, it's kind of a clean break. And so getting more into details now, the guide RNA and another type of RNA form a complex, which directs the Cas9 protein to the specific target DNA sequence that will be cut. And it's acting like molecular scissors when it's there, snipping at a precise point in the cell's DNA. A new gene or sequence of DNA can be inserted where that's being cut. And this is how we're starting to kind of mess with how the system works in our favor. This is where we're starting to gene editing. We're not just turning, we're not destroying a virus here. We're actually targeting our own DNA with this system. And with by making guide RNAs can point those molecular scissors to cut at a certain point in the human genome and either knock out a gene from being active or inserting a new one or replacing a gene that maybe was faulty. So this is where we're getting into a lot of genetic editing. And we can look at the function levels of genes and the expression levels 
of what's happening in order to study CRISPR technology. So I keep talking about CRISPR-Cas9. There's another type of CRISPR system that is gaining more popularity. It's called CRISPR-CPFL. And CRISPR-CPFL and CRISPR-Cas9 are two systems that have some differing aspects. So the CRISPR-Cas9, the one I've been talking about, requires two RNAs, the guide RNA and another type of RNA, to guide the Cas enzyme to cut the DNA. So that forms a complex between the two. That's the Cas9 system. Now, the CPFL system is more simplistic, only requiring one RNA. And due to the Cas9 enzyme structure consisting of two RNAs, it's a little bit bigger than the CPFL enzyme structure that only has one RNA. And size is an important factor when attempting to deliver enzymes into cells and tissues. Because the CPFL are smaller enzymes, they're easier to deliver. And remember, when we're talking about genetic engineering, or genetic engineering or genetic editing, genetic editing first, engineering comes a little bit later. But when we're talking about genetic editing, we want to be able to deliver these to certain sites in the body or all over, depending on the type of disease, in order to actually have it work. So if the enzyme is smaller, it's going to be easier to deliver there. The types of cuts the enzymes perform are different too. So the Cas9 protein cuts the DNA, leaving a blunt end, as I said before. It's a double-stranded break, but it leaves no bases unpaired. Now the CPFL leaves sticky ends, where two strands of DNA are not cut in the same location. They're cut so that there's a couple bases that are left unpaired. And those are very different between Cas9 and CPFL. CPFL leaves those sticky ends. But the sticky ends are kind of a good thing because it creates what's known as an overhang of DNA, where these bases are left unpaired and exposed. But the benefit of having an overhang DNA strand is the increased precision of integrating an inserted gene. So if we want to put a, a gene in there, if it has nothing to bind to, and it's just kind of trying to get in the middle of two blunt ends, it's going to be hard to incorporate. But if we have these sticky ends where a gene can be put in, but automatically bind and create a bond between those extra bases that are out, that's going to be a little bit easier to integrate. Many gene editing technologies are really expensive, slow, hard to use. They're not very universal. CRISPR, on the other hand, is relatively inexpensive, fast, and easy. Competitor genetic editing technologies like zinc fingers cost approximately $5,000 to order, and specialists are needed to perform the assay, and that's going to be even more expensive to hire someone to actually do this. Now let's compare this to CRISPR. It only requires researchers to buy a $30 RNA fragment. So before I was talking about $5,000. Now we're talking about a $30 RNA fragment. And researchers do not need as advanced training. You can pretty much train anyone in a lab to use CRISPR. It's not that difficult to be able to implement in your lab. And another advantage of CRISPR-Cas9 is its ability to target multiple genes at the same time. This is an aspect most other gene editing technologies just simply can't do. So CRISPR is not only fast, easier to use, it also can be used for more by targeting multiple genes. So the history of CRISPR is relatively new technology. It's a history is a little bit shorter than most things that we are learning in genetics, but there's been a lot of important milestones in this short history. So the first time CRISPR was reported, it was found in E. coli in 1987, not so long ago. But its function could not be characterized at the time. We didn't know what it really was, just that we found something, and we found in E. coli. Then in 1993, CRISPR sequences were recognized to be a family of repeats. Remember those palindromic repeats? That's when this was recognized. And by 2000, CRISPR loci had been found in 20 different microbes. So instead of it just being in coli, we were like, whoa, it's in a lot other different types of microbes, bacteria. And CRISPR was then coined in 2002. In 2008, it was biochemically characterized a complex of five Cas proteins. Now remember, the Cas proteins are the enzymes that are cutting the DNA. 
and the CRISPR system was successfully reconstructed from one type of organism to another. That was another big milestone. And it was discovered that a certain bacteria can acquire resistance against a virus-like molecule through the CRISPR system. This was the first time we saw that it has immunity, that it serves a purpose in a bacteria to be a defense system. And in 2012, this is very exciting and where the potential for gene editing biotechnology was really realized. This is when the Cas9 molecule was reprogrammed to cut a target site of interest. So instead of kind of observing how CRISPR-Cas9 works, we actually were able to reprogram the Cas9 molecule to say, we want you to cut here instead. And by being able to manipulate this, that's when we start getting into the genetic engineering or genetic editing. In 2003, it was discovered that multiple mammalian genes could be edited at the same time by programming the CRISPR arrays. And I mentioned that before as being a really big advantage of CRISPR. And 2013 is really the year when it became widespread. I said it really has been blowing up in the past three years. And scientific interest in research labs and even commercially with future applications in mind, like human therapeutic methods and even designer babies, which is kind of a scare of some people, but it kind of always seems to be a scare of people whenever we get new advances in genetics. Now, the first use of CRISPR is to fix a disease-causing mutation in an adult animal was in 2014, so even more promise for using it as a genetic therapy. The next year, in September 2015, CRISPR CPFL was successfully harnessed as a simpler, more precise system for CRISPR. That's what I mentioned before of comparing the Cas9 system to the CPFL system. CPFL is a little, it's smaller, so it's a little more, um, travels easier. And as I said, there were other advantages that went to that. And the big thing that was so recently, in March 2016, the journal Cell published an article making history. Science were able to target RNA. So most of the time I've been talking about DNA, focusing on the DNA, the genome. But now we're able to target RNA and living cells using the CRISPR-Cas9 system. And in order to find treatments and cures to diseases, like I mentioned before, autism, cancer, HIV, researchers must be able to measure RNA's movements throughout the cell as these diseases have that defective RNA transport. RNA transport is not working. And by tracking RNA and being able to change it and edit it, that would be monumental in the field in order to look for cures for those diseases. And so many more. That's just some of the top that a lot of headlines have had recently. If CRISPR technology is implemented into medicine, it'll be a huge leap forward in gene therapy. CRISPR technology has significant implications for personalized medicine as CRISPR can be modified to cut specific genes. It's not just pointing at, say, the HTT gene on chromosome 4 for Huntington's disease. It can target anything, BRCA2, BRCA1, It can be modified to target anything. And that's what makes it so, such good potential for genetic therapy. Now, the first clinical trials of gene therapy with CRISPR could happen in the next one to two years, but I've read that it could be longer. So that is something that people are projecting and very hard to say, but definitely soon. Maybe not next one to two years, but definitely soon. And how it will probably work is that CRISPR components, so the guide RNA and the other type of RNA that is needed to bring that Cas9 enzyme to a specific place, a specific locus in our genome and cut, all of those will probably be directed into tissues or cells. And those tissues and cells will be extracted. And then that's when we'll have the genetic editing happening, and then return it back to the body once it's looking healthy and looking good. And it's possible in the near future we could use this technology to fix defective segments of genes in diseases that are caused by point mutations, like cystic fibrosis, single sickle cell anemia, Tay-Sachs disease. All of these diseases are only caused by a change in one base, and by changing that, people can be cured from these diseases. So those are probably the diseases that are going to be looked at first because they are the simplest on the genetic level. 
And some labs have already found successful trials treating mice with genetic diseases by using this genetic editing technology. So if it's working in mice, that means we really are on the way to using it um, and kind of starting the whole process of developing drugs from it. But that is a very long process, but we're starting it. What is interesting about CRISPR right now in the news is who owns the patent to CRISPR. It's currently being fought. The battle took off in 2014, and it's expected to be settled in 2017. The two parties fighting for the passion are Zhang from the Broad Institute at MIT and Duna from the University of California, Berkeley. And Zhang from MIT is the one that really discovered the CRISPR CPFL system. And in Berkeley, they're the ones that really pioneered the Cas9 system. So those are the two that I compared before. And those are the two that are really, really high into the patent battle. And it's very very raging battle that's happening and there's always updates on what's happening in that but there's a lot at stake here so CRISPR could be worth hundreds of millions of dollars maybe even more and really revolutionize science so who gets the credit for this and who gets the money for this is obviously a very big deal the United States Patent and Trademark Office granted a motion for patent interference and which party ends up winning may really influence who's allowed to use the technology and under what terms right now how it works is that labs can use CRISPR freely for research and academic purposes, but once someone owns this patent, all of that could change. And if labs can't freely use this, it may take much longer for the CRISPR system to be used in genetic engineering, genetic editing, gene therapy, because there's less people working on it, so less progress being made. So that's something that is really interesting and up in the air as to how that's really going to work. So there's a lot of current research in cancer applications right now. Um, different ones that are happening are knockout studies, targeted therapy research, and drug resistance studies. So the knockout studies, these induce targeted loss of function mutations, and they're utilized to observe the role of specific genes in cancer progression and drug resistance. So if we take colorectal cancer, for example, colorectal cancer takes a lot of mutations it needs to acquire many mutations to become cancer. And this takes a while. Colorectal cancer is one of the slowest moving cancers, which is why it's so preventable, by the way. But in the colorectal cancer system, we have the APC gene is usually mutated, then the KRAS, a um, couple more, and then P53. And by knocking out certain genes, we can see, can we prevent cancer from proliferating? So if we knock out a gene or we change its level of expression, can we prevent this cancer? So if we start at the APC gene, if we change expression levels of that gene, can we prevent the rest of cancer from proliferating? So it's a very interesting way of looking at cancer and targeting it. Now, targeted therapy research, there is a search for therapeutic drugs that play a role in disease progression. Disruption of specific genes can lead to better prognosis. And the replacement of defective gene sequences with a normal fragment is what I talked about before. If you have sickle cell anemia and you have a defective gene, that gene can be cut out and a new fragment can be put in and then you're cured. This is all, you know, um, what we believe and theoretical, that's how it should work. But in practice, it's a little bit harder than that. But that's the idea behind it. And CRISPR is utilized in cervical cancer prevention. So they're doing research on cervical cancer and if we can use the CRISPR system to prevent cervical cancer because it is a very prevalent cancer um, in women. Now, drug-resistant studies, these are kind of interesting. There is a possibility of engineering tumor cells to be more receptive to chemotherapy. And how this works is that instead of just giving someone chemo and hoping it's really going to kill the cancer cells, we can say, let's tweak the cancer cells, make them a little bit weaker and more susceptible 
to chemotherapy. And then when we give someone chemotherapy, it's going to be easier to then target those cells during chemotherapy. You're kind of weakening it and then killing them. So the location of genes prominent in drug resistance is very important because we want to be able to identify all of those and manipulate them to our advantage. So there are a lot of future applications of the CRISPR-Cas9 system. It has the ability to play a major role on the treatment of cancer, as I said, and we can even eliminate germline mutations in genes such as BRCA1 or 2, and if we're doing that, then if a embryo, say, doesn't have this BRCA1 or 2 mutation, then they're at the normal population level of developing cancer as opposed to maybe their mother who had that um, who had that mutation in their BRCA1 or 2. But before this can happen, the accuracy of CRISPR must be improved. We need way more research to achieve this goal because it's not as easy as cutting it, pasting it in. There's a lot of different things. Genomic instability is a major one that there are ways that the genome is activated, inactivated, regulated, that really can be affected by just cutting something out and putting it in. So I mentioned embryos. Genetic engineering on human embryos is something that has always been very controversial. And it really is the next step, though, in using CRISPR for genetic editing. It's currently being done in the UK, China, and Sweden. And a recent, recent announcement of the UK has allowed research on human embryos, and it's been a major media topic. Another way that CRISPR is currently being used um, in China is the beta thalassemia study. So they're using non-viable human embryos discarded by intra, uh, intravenous fertilization, and they're studying the therapeutic options for blood disorder beta thalassemia. And how it works is that the CRISPR-Cas9 cleaves the beta globin gene successfully, and it issues arose while it was doing this, um, while it was trying to reintroduce the correct DNA fragment, so they can cut it pretty well, and they can so cleave, so we're cutting it out. But introducing the new DNA fragment is a little bit harder. So some embryos had cells that had it and cells that didn't. Those are known as mosaic. Um, some had mutations that were induced from it. So the DNA tries to heal itself and fix itself after this new fragment is introduced to kind of seal it into the genome. But mutations can occur while it's trying to do that, which is a big problem of CRISPR. And so this just proved that the CRISPR technology still really needs to be refined. And it's not as accurate as we first imagined. But again, the potential is there. We just really need to work on it a little bit harder. Now, there is policy on gene editing in the U.S., and the fiscal year 2016, they had language prohibiting the use of federal funds toward the editing of embryos. And as I said, this is really the next big step of CRISPR. And they make the language very hard to understand, but basically the NIH will not fund any research utilizing gene editing technology on human embryos. That was the law in 1996. Now, a bill proposed in 2015 that would require the FDA to create a religious council to review gene editing requests was done, which, I mean, that's a whole conversation in itself of, you know, we have church and state happening, but here it seems to be a little blended. And so this means that the government cannot use any of its research funding on human embryos. However, Privately funded research on human embryos is legal in the United States. If you have the money to, you can do research on human embryos. Now, most people don't have the money to, but if you can, and if you have that, you can do research on them, and people are in the U.S. Um, it may not be as highlighted as some people, you know, would want it to be, but it is being done. There's a lot of ethics surrounding gene editing, um, we could stop the suffering of individuals with inherited disease that's called non-maleficence. And we could get designer babies from this, but as I said before, this is a scare of the public with every new genetic technology and new methods of doing things. We also have the eugenics movement that 
we could end up kind of editing, you know, embryos and choosing certain characteristics that we'd like, certain traits, um, athletic ability, intelligence. But these are all things that are way beyond us currently, but maybe not in the future. But utilization of human embryos for research would have a major impact on germline changes on the future generations, because if we can change a germline mutation, that's going to change the offspring. That, you know, you change something in the embryo, and they, all the other cells will have whatever you changed if you're starting on that basic of a level. The CRISPR system really has so much potential. Potential is really the word to use here because we're working out so many different bugs that come with genetic editing with CRISPR, but it really could be the future of genetic therapy, genetic editing, and definitely keep your eye out on it and just everything that's happening with it, the ethical conversations with it, the patent that is currently being fought, the current research happening with it. These are all things that are really interesting to keep up with and just see where CRISPR goes. And it's moving very rapidly, so we really should see changes, you know, as we go here. But that wraps up today's episode of DNA Today. You can go to at DNA Podcast on Twitter for genetic updates, dnapodcast.com for all episodes, and info at dnapodcast.com for all questions and comments. Thanks for listening, and join me next week to learn and discover new advances in the world of genetics.